All right, number eight. The disk nebula, which are observed, are evidence for planet formation. And this is a majorly bad assumption. Okay. They're not evidence for planet formation. They're evidence for planet destruction and collision events. The disks radiate strongly in the infrared, meaning the material is liquid, hot, like magma. Think of shrapnel from artillery. In essence, there are shrapnel fields, and the shrapnel can re-enter the atmospheres of other stars as meteors, and can be found on the ground as meteorites. And then, they also leave rings around other evolved stars and asteroid fields and in meteor showers. That's all it is. That's all those disks are. They're, they're remains of a collision event, so something really big slammed into something else. So you have these two bodies slamming into each other, okay? And then boom, a lot of material just stays in orbit around itself at, after it's smashed into each other. So you have these weird looking rings around the object. And this is all determined upon how big the object was when they slammed together and a whole bunch of other uh, ideas. And if there's gaps inside here, that means other objects were uh, in the vicinity when it all went down. But the astronomers are like, oh, well, we see planets being formed. No, planets are being destroyed. Here's another major assumption that needs to be corrected. The evolution of all solar system objects relies on the fate of the sun alone. And I have here the solar system is clearly an adopted family with many solar systems inside of it. Think of Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus. You know, they have their own, their own bodies that orbit it. It is much more reasonable to actually look at the objects and notice they are all different in size, look different, and are in different random orbits, meaning the sun plays a minor and temporary role in their evolution. Minor and temporary role. It's a complete turnaround in philosophy we're dealing with here. Here's another major assumption. The Earth always had a really thin atmosphere. Since the Earth evolved from a much larger state, its atmosphere was actually vastly thicker and thinned as it evolved from its current stage of evolution. We can observe the Earth as it was in earlier stages of evolution. They're called stars, gas giants, brown dwarfs. We can also observe the future fate of the Earth. They are called population four stars, which are Mercury, Venus, and Mars. Now it's pretty straightforward. Here's another major assumption. The current orbital configurations of the solar system objects became their original orientation soon after they all formed out of a disk. What this does is it assumes capture is impossible and orbits cannot change regardless of if we have observed exoplanets, evolved stars, and retrograde orbits and offset axes. The rule of thumb for solar system formation is that all the objects is that the objects are all captured to form the system. The disk theory is not needed at all. At all. It is clear that large objects capture smaller ones as the larger have more angular momentum. This is how all solar system or all star systems form. Binary, triple, quad systems, you know, quint systems, uh, on, 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 on. The iron cores of the older stars, planets such as Mercury, Mars, Venus, Earth, formed at around the same time as their crusts. And I go up and change with this one. This assumption forcefully places the differentiation process, meaning layered process, itself as a quick, secondary, and unimportant process compared to the concept of plate tectonics, regardless if the core is a much larger, centralized object which gives the Earth its very structure and size. If anything, the crust receives the majority of the attention because it is what we interact with, and geologists focus on the crust more than anything else. A more reasonable, realistic approach is to look at the Earth itself as a vast three-dimensional structure, and the crust is a secondary, if not unimportant, feature in regards to the evolution of the Earth itself. The crust has its importance for the sustaining of life, but it is not the structure which the Earth relies on for stability. The core is the foundational structure to begin the differentiation process itself during stellar evolution. What I mean by this is as the star is really hot, bright, energetic, it begins forming the little ball in the center, and that's what it all starts off with. You have to form that little iron core in the center before all the other things can layer on top of it. As well, there is an absence of volcanism on older dead stars, meaning their cores also remain regardless of if there are any plate tectonics. 
as well plate tectonics itself does not account for the evolution of earth during earlier stages this is very important plate tectonics does not include earth when it was in gaseous and plasmatic stages therefore it's probably a vastly incomplete theory and probably uses ideas which have no mechanism such as what the driving force for the plates really is if you want my honest opinion on plate tectonics what we're dealing with here is just the earth has a big it has a big uh single singular crust and the heat escapes in random portions of it that's it it's like a uh, concrete when you look at concrete on the ground you have a big slab and you have like a crack going through it in different places like this that's all it is it's just falling inwards due to gravity and that's it that's why there's fault that's what fault lines are and then the heat escapes through these little cracks that's it there's no moving plates it's ridiculous but uh I'll go over 13 in another talk, but I think that will sum up what's going on for now. Alright, later.